Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Perfights, where I, well, you may be missing my French uh, friend Henrik, but today I have another <laughs> substitute from the same uh, world location. <laughs> Not a substitute, it's a guest. Today, I have with me our amigo uh, Matthew Leroux. Did I pronounce it right? Good enough. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And welcome, Matthew. Um, how are you doing? And could you please pronounce your name in the right way? <laughs> sure, sure. Um, I'm great, actually. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. And, um, and you say my name like Mathieu Leroux. Yeah. Mathieu Leroux. Mathieu Leroux. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm trying. I'm, I'm doing my best. And um, well, again, welcome to the show. For the people that uh, do not know our guest today, uh, Mathieu, Le Mathieu Leroux, uh, I'm going to be butchering it for the whole That's episode. Right. <laughs> um, he's a performance engineer who has been doing this for about or over 15 years. Yo, uh, as far as I remember, you have gone from Uh, consulting and performance testing, application performance management, uh, moved on to continuous testing, and recently transitioned to, well, developer experience where you are kind of dealing in empowering developers for performance testing. And, well, freelancing a little bit more and supporting communities, right? Um, did I miss anything, Matthew, that you would like to touch on? No, 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 that's great. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I hit it, hit all the points uh, at the first blast. <laughs> yeah. And uh, for the ones wondering, Matthew comes today, uh, I'm going to say Matt because I, I think I keep butchering your name. Um, Matt comes today to explain and give us a perspective on developers joining in performance tasks or sharing uh, those tasks with developers, which, I mean... I'm really sorry for the ones that think that, um, well, I, I didn't say it in a diminishing tone uh, towards developers. We love them. I have a great ap appreciation for them. I'm a former developer. But you, I believe you, you are a former developer as well, right? Um, I'd say on the side, but uh, I mainly come from a, a testing background, yeah. Mm. Well, it's important to have some of that experience as well uh, nowadays. And, um, well, before we get into the topic, uh, Matthew, what, Matt, Matthew, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, can, you, can you share with the audience, with everybody watching, uh, what have you been up to lately? What have you been your doings or uh, recent, I don't know, achievements, um, goals, appearances? Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess that my latest achievement um, is not so important when it comes to performance engineering or performance testing. Uh, but to me, it's a great step. You know, I, I don't have a, a, a very profound entrepreneurial spirit, but after 15 years of, uh, of being an employee, I finally uh, started my own company, right? So freelancing is kind of new to me, so I'm trying to get used to it. And uh, as you know, it's a world where things go very fast and changes um, fall upon you um, without you having any a prior warning. So it, it's always a very interesting experience. Um, and yeah, lately I've been working for a, a big retail uh, company from France, a worldwide group. Um, and we've done pretty interesting uh, work. And actually, uh, this client came up uh, in the Perth Bytes previously in the, in the French uh, in the French chapter. So I encourage anybody to uh, to look at this. Of course, it's in French. Sorry, guys. Uh, but um, the folks here have been doing tremendous work when it comes to uh, automated analysis. So that's uh, a subject I encourage anybody to, to dive into. Yeah, I, I think, um, thank you also for promoting uh, the Perfite Fonse. Um, Yeah, it's a great opportunity as well, not only to learn more about performance, to learn what is happening over there in um, French-speaking uh, areas of the world, but as well uh, to practice a little bit. Uh, je ne comprends pas trop bien le français. Uh, <laughs> but I think it would be uh, a, a great addition if you want to kind of tune your ear, especially, I think, for the pronunciation of uh 
French ways of performance terms, because uh, whenever I am in Perfites Español trying to bring performance testing topics and terms that we're used to hearing in English, I'm like, ¿Cómo? How do you pronounce that in Spanish? ¿Qué? And, and it's always a very interesting exercise. So thank you for, for the plug. And um, I'm happy to hear that um, you are collaborating with some of the teams which have been already uh, come and share the knowledge with us in, in our shows. And just quickly, I think I forgot to mention, where in France are you located? What is the uh, section? Yeah, so I've, um, I've spent most of my life in the... Paris area, but since COVID, my wife and I and uh, our two beautiful daughters uh, have moved to Nantes, so we are near the coast, the western coast now. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I think that um, not everything was gloom and doom. I'm sure that living near the coast must have some advantages and <laughs> be prettier. Oh, yeah. And I, I want to come back before we dive into the topic. Um, you mentioned some challenges in entrepreneurship and some learnings that you have been having lately. And I think that there's a slight chance that uh, some people in the audience may be um, wondering or with it an itch to say like, hey, what if I also want to uh, freelance start my company or start doing, what would you say are the three greatest learnings, challenges that you have had becoming a, a, a perfpreneur or something like that? <laughs> oh, that's a good word. Um, uh, th that's a good question, actually. Um, so let me reflect for a second. I think that the most important lesson comes from uh, my background in uh, in the, the service, you know, professional services uh, industry, doing software testing, right? Uh, it's just that when you're not in-house, you have to understand uh, where the client comes from, really, what they need, and what they need usually isn't what they tell you they need, right? You need to explore a bit. You need to ask questions. You need to be very curious. And you also need to stand your ground when it comes to maybe sometimes the prices, sometimes the conditions, but also the principles, you know? You need to um, to, to carry really the, the gospel, I get, I'd say, um, because you need to influence them. When, when they go to a freelancer, they want to be influenced. They're not looking for just execution. So you need to have an opinion. You need to be able to state it in a way that's understandable and palatable. Or how would you say palatable? Yeah, more palatable um, to the client. So I, I'd say that's the main point. You need, able, you need to be able to talk business. Uh, you need to be able to talk uh, customer rather than just technical um, uh, technical stuff yeah i think that that challenge comes from uh you are kind of doing sales and cl closing the deal which i remember in the consultancy days i had to explain and make things uh translate them into c-level language uh where where yeah they didn't care about throughputs or things like that but the project was already there was already sold was already i kind of had to attach to the deliverables that were in the contract. I'm guessing that you are landing those and trying to um, get everyone comfortable and at ease with what you are gonna be uh, delivering. As you said, be careful with the, <laughs> um, this, this, well, the deliverables, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's very risky. You need to be very careful about the stuff you, prom you promise uh, because mm -hmm. you need to deliver that afterwards. And I always have very a great respect for the people in our sector, in our area of expertise, who can say, we're going to decrease your response times by that much because we know we have sufficient information from the system you run and we are confident we can do this and that. Um, that's not the level of confidence I have in myself, but if these people and some of these people actually deliver, Right. Um, so I have great respect for the people who can go past the imposter syndrome and uh, prom do promises and deliver on these promises. Um, mm. but yeah, yeah, you need to be very careful. And again, it's all about discovery and curiosity because, uh, yeah, most most of the time um, it hurts. 
in other places. And I think it uh, it's, um, articulates pretty beautifully the discussion we're about to have. Yeah, I mean, mini, uh, speaking of, um, I think I deviated a little bit. The topic I was very curious because I know of many performance engineers that maybe like with that itch, like say, like I want to do that myself and provide the services. But going back to, to, to the main topic of the episode, you bring this um, idea, not new because I have heard it on several places, of involving the developers in the performance testing uh, practices, tasks, as we were saying earlier, deliverables and uh, things that have to be done. And I, I, I wonder why do you think that it's uh, important that we start uh, uh, boarding these practices, uh, involving our developer friends? Again, friends, we should not be enemies. That's a, a very big problem. Uh, why, why, why do you think we should be, or, or why do you bring this topic? Well, the truth is that my previous job was about doing exactly that. Uh, I was recruited to do that, and the company very openly stated at the very beginning of the recruitment process that I was under no circumstance going to be doing tests myself. Cool. Um, so, of course, there's a couple of um, of side notes, you know, um, that that we could raise and say, uh, you always do a bit of stuff yourself because you have to. But the main part was that I was to support, to teach, to provide tooling, um, to provide guidance, vision, strategy, and everything to the table. And they were not looking for a big um, performance testing or big performance engineering team. They wanted to really empower their developers. So that's the first uh, reason. And the second reason is that I always felt a bit uneasy every time I was um, told about this kind of initiative, you know, in my previous companies or with my previous clients. Uh, because at some point, someone's going to say, why do we need these specialists? Because developers know, know the stuff they, pro they, they produce, right? So they should be able to test it uh, uh, pre pretty uh, efficiently um, and and in a, in in a very uh, yeah they, they should be able to deliver uh, improvements when it comes to performance because that's their code right mm -hmm. and I feel I felt I felt uneasy because most of the time the organizations were not properly built for that uh, there's a few I feel prerequisites to be able to do that um, in 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 the right way and we're going to talk about that later on. Uh, but also, I felt inside that I was maybe hiding something, right? <laughs> maybe trying to protect my work a bit too much. And maybe I was just a bit too prideful to admit that if I learned performance testing and performance engineering, why developers wouldn't be able to do that? Why wouldn't they be able to do that? In the end, you know, it's just software. So a good developer should be able to properly test their application in the end. You know? What kind of skill I, I, are they not able to learn? I think there's there's also a small line because performance engineering and testing involves several tasks. And I think as you were as you're saying, we have had our hard earned experience learning and uh, situations that we have been around. Uh, but at the same time, not all the tasks are like these super high achievable, unachievable things, except by experience. There are some things that we can share with developers. And of course it will offload our, uh, workload. I, I really wouldn't like to be at the end of a second sprint being the only one responsible for the, all the performance automations, but, um, I agree with you. There are some things that are like, oh, it took me this amount of years to really learn how to script or, and this involves also like old time scripting where you record and uh, do reverse engineering. But this, this, these things, what, and as you mentioned, there are some downsides, there are some th situations um, that you encounter so that not only for you, but how, how, how have you been like working through to over overcome these situations and 
your personal situations, and I'm guessing there are some others around, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, I think that it all it all calls down. Sorry, it all comes down to the organization has made a choice. So the choice is done. It's been made for you. We're going to move forward with this, with or without you. So now, knowing that you're a seasoned professional, what would be the success uh, levers or success factors to be able to get us to a certain point? Right. So you need to ask yourself, okay, I don't feel right giving everything to developers right now. So this is going to be a process, expectedly. You do not jump from day one to we have no performance specialists in the organization and we're going to give everything to developers because that would be, of course, it's a bold choice. But since the organization was not built from the ground up that way, you need to change things a bit along the way to be able to get there. Um, so I feel that we need to identify what are the pros of that kind of organization or that kind of setup, right? And what would be the cons? What are the things we need to be mindful of? Um, the first thing that comes to mind would be confirmation bias, right? Because developers have a vested interest in having the code they produce to be working properly. You know? Maybe they are compensated in a way that prevents them in some spaces to, re to, to really raise defects, right? If you have bonuses, uh, when your code is working fine, maybe you do not want to create a defect that belongs to your real estate. That's conflict of interest 101, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and maybe your company, you know, the environment in which you are, maybe you have developers that do not care about quality. Maybe the organization, the organization, sorry, uh, put so much pressure in delivering things fast that when it comes to it, when you have to choose between releasing an, an incomplete feature, it's always the release that goes forward. It's never, uh, let's do that properly and wait another two weeks. So in the end, that kind of an organization is not going to work well with testing uh, being done by uh, developers uh, only, right? I think I think in the in this moment point that um, you mentioned is where your worry that you mentioned earlier about like mm, all that I learned or that I was doing in terms of performance, uh, these companies thinking that they can just wash out and pass it to the developers. But uh, as you very well mentioned, there's some input, some experience that um, sadly only being in, in the fields, like in the war zones that, or, or uh, war rooms, because yeah, some load test executions were done in war rooms that only we know and that only us have like achieved the the experience even if the developers eventually start to learn and get some of this but we are the departure point of that information right yes 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 i'm not trying to argue that we are in the end useless mm -hmm. right um what i'm no, saying no, but that's like this this concern people are worried about that right yeah they should be um but my point why is, should they uh, because there's a certain amount of the daily tasks that we do that is going to inevitably disappear at some point. You know, I'm not just brandishing AI uh, all the way and saying we're going to disappear tomorrow. But that's the that's how things evolve, right? Um, for for those of us who have worked on very ancient protocols, there's a, a variety of things we use to do that is absolutely useless to us today. So, of course, what we know today is going to be obsolete at some point. So we need to change along the way to be able to have a certain area of expertise that is useful to the organization. Um, so what I'm saying is, yes, specialists, we always be useful. But I guess that the question is, are we always that useful to every organization, for every kind of business, for every kind of software? And are we useful all day, every day? You know, I think there's a certain amount of tasks that can be given to developers and they will do a great job with them. But when it I comes think, to the war rooms, of course, we need to be careful about that. Yeah. I, I think that from what you are um, bringing up, the, the, the concern of us like being 
like, hey, if I used to uh, my my time, let's say fifty percent, probably more of my time in a project was dedicated to scripting, and you tell me like, hey, we're gonna pass scripting to the developers because they are probably the best ones. They know the te- the solution, the software, blah. What am I gonna do now? And in 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 my perspective, it's a little bit like um, a doctor. If if the doctor had to get the patient, talk to them, and then take the x-rays, take the blood blood work by the doctor, uh, I think that the time would be a little bit wasted. And that's why modern medicine doctors say like, hey, quickly go to this place, get your x-rays, that other place, get your blood work, get this, 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 and that. Come back to me because I have the experience. I am the one that can give an interpretation to this, this, and that. And in that way, it's not that the doctor is like, ah, I'm jobless now. I can't, um, I, I, the, the charges and the things that I used to do, like taking the blood or putting the people in the x-ray machine. Well, that doesn't mean that the doctor is useless or has less money. They just can attend more patients. They are more efficient on the things that they are the best at. I think that's a perspective that for us performance engineers could be a good sell, sell point or to not to be worried or... <laughs> Actually, I, I think it's a good selling point for soft skills because, interestingly, um, I think, but I'm not a doctor myself, so maybe I could <laughs> have it wrong, but I feel that um, doctors usually start diagnosing by talking to their patients. And only mm-hmm. after that, the technical diagnostics only answer, as, only fill in the gap. Confirms. Right, yes. Um, it feels like this to me. So interestingly, I think that um, the analogy still works. It's just that the part where the technical diagnosis comes in is going to be so fast, right? So easy to do, so uninvasive, that in the mm-hmm. end, it's going to take way less time. And an emphasis is going to be put on actually talking to your, pa- to your patient. Right. Um, so to get back to performance testing and performance <laughs> engineering, um, you, I think, aptly raised the thing about scripting. Back in the day, mm-hmm. sorry, I don't have the gray hair visible here, but it's there. <laughs> back in the day, we spent an insane amount of time reverse engineering the applications, right? And mm-hmm. we spent maybe 60 to 80% of the time automating the application. And with whatever was left with the budget, we did testing, tuning, and everything, but usually, um, you know, for big corporations, we didn't have that much time beside uh, scripting. And today, especially when you give the performance testing to developers, do they actually need to reverse engineer everything? They've created the application. They don't need mm-hmm. to reverse engineer things. They've engineered it, right? Mm-hmm. So that time has disappeared. And for or us, should, also, in my yeah. opinion, <laughs> yeah, and. Also, the reverse engineering uh, uh, efforts that we did have kind of disappeared when it comes to microservices as well, right? Mm. The REST API is much more um, easy to automate than a, a, a big monolith, you know, a big um, vendor application that you just buy and use that way because you've not engineered it. And And... You're making me think about these automations and these processes that, yes, we shouldn't be using the old tools that we used to have in in the past for that were complicated, super fun. I, I frequently refer it as a Stockholm syndrome because eventually you end up doing uh, loving correlations and those things that were. Quite, quite frankly, horrible. <laughs> uh, but we end up enjoying it and we end up becoming ex- experts on it. And it makes me wonder, like, this this has to have a different perspective on uh, choosing the tooling wisely or doing uh, things that developers can get on board that are not oriented at these reverse engineering tasks, but something more streamlined. What What, what are your takes around that? I think that um, first, there's a series of good tools these days, right? And I think that the first factor would be it absolutely has to be code-based. 
because uh, I mean as code, right? Mm -hmm. Because have you tried talking a developer into using um, a, a human interface based tool? Usually it doesn't work really well, you know, right? They don't they they don't get very much interest. Uh, they they don't put very much interest in there. So I think that's the first factor. The second factor would be the test these days when it comes to unit testing, right? It goes along the code. It's actually part of the code. Um, mm -hmm. So it's very elegant in a way because it's a self-evaluating piece of software when it really comes down to it. Um, so the test belong to the to the code. It's like if you had an MRI machine plugged into your brain and something that is able to test it every day, all day, right? So it, it's pretty elegant in a way. Um, but you wouldn't do that with, going back to the code, you wouldn't do that with two separate languages. It doesn't make sense, right? To have Python code on, uh, on one side and to have JavaScript on the other end. Well, I know some organizations who do that. And, and, and I am going to debate this because... I, I have a justification. Let's say Python and you are developing some AI stuff with some other non-AI stuff. You're kind of stuck with both, right? Okay, so that was a pretty bold statement. And thank you for <laughs> calling me out on it because we need to keep the conversation honest, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's very true. Of course, there's a series of exceptions in where doing something unusual and that doesn't make sense out of the box actually makes sense in that particular um, environment, right? Mm -hmm. But in the grand scheme of things, if you could choose any tool, you should probably choose a tool that um, works in the same language as the, the, the kind of language you're trying to cover. Well, and I'm going to extend what you're saying. If you have multiple languages, would you close it to not who, to have multiple tools? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> I think I wouldn't have um, a problem if, if I'm testing an application that has many different languages in there. I wouldn't have a problem bringing a different a tool that works in a different language, another one, um, as long as developers are willing to work with it. You know, I, I, as my, long... my, from what you say, if the tool has a programming language or something like that that the developers are already using, you're bringing down the barriers for them, right? And sometimes the developers are proficient in a language they're not using to code the oh, yeah, application. Cool. Maybe you have kind of an original um, environment, right? Maybe you're uh, producing an application in Haskell, and but all your developers have a background in JavaScript or Python and everything, so mm -hmm. or Java even, right? So sometimes it's not an issue. It's just. I think it's one of the many success factors. It just makes things easier, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and fact, I think that's that's a key with the tools. Make it easier, right? Yeah, yeah. In fact, um, I think that the overall strategy is to make it painless, right? Most developers will not enjoy having to break their workflow to do things that do not look like producing code. Uh, technical stuff that do not look like producing code. So you, you, by making it look like uh, they're producing still feature code, you kind of make it easier for them to see the light. Hmm. Right? It's much more efficient. Totally. I mean, if you bring down the barriers of adoption for them to get the steps, I think even if they are when, when you mentioned uh, uh, unitary tests and things that are embedded with the code, if your tool uses common code and can even pull from the code of the solution, because that's another practice, your testing code, in my opinion, should be together with the application's code. And that way, I think it's even easier for developers like, hey, and, and, per, and when they are used to command line tools, especially in modern days where continuous integration is another key factor. I think it um, makes it easier to them. But in, in, in the same line, do you see challenges around this? Like what, 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 are, uh, what is the other side of the coin that you see in um, implementing all this? Um, I, I'm sorry, I lost you. Can't, uh, 
so uh, when yeah 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 when we are trying to bring the barriers down to make things easier for developers mm -hmm. what would be the things that make them harder or like cuz i know that there may be challenges where um i don't know if you would just want developer and, and that's something that i wanted to bring up i wouldn't make developers do load tests that's where mm. you need the performance engineer to have the right mix to know what is the utilization here here and there and that developers are to do another type of performance with these tools right yes um i think that it all it all comes down again to um something that i think james pooley uh, coined which is a scale for one mm -hmm. right so before you get to load testing which is um, admittedly, something that we um, all timers again uh, <laughs> tend to jump to. Uh, maybe it's maybe it's too early. Most of the time, it's too early. So you need to be able to test for just a single user. That's all right. So you don't necessarily need load testing capability in the tools you provide to the developers. In the end, we want to do this, right? But if you have nothing, that's not where you should start. And another argument for this is that if we if we want to you know go up a level again, so we've left load testing on the side, maybe we need to think about um, leaving runtime testing on the side and think about static testing first, right? Static analysis. Some of these static analysis tools out there have the ability to spot performance issues before you even get to the runtime. So mm -hmm. I believe it would be much more efficient to provide the developer with a tool that is able to tell him to tell them when they are actually writing the code that no 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 they're making a mistake right now and we don't need to compile, we don't need to go through the CI C D system to have this answer. So the feedback loop just gets shorter and shorter. And that's the important stuff, right? That's the whole thing about uh, linting tools, right? You don't need to compile the code to see that you've made a, a syntax error someplace. Uh, it just tells you right away, uh, you've you've lost a, a semicolon here, so it's not going to work. So how would you apply some of these things? Because what you're saying is just compiler early detection. How would you early detection of performance things for developers? Because I, I totally agree with you. The mm -hmm. best performing code is the code that leaves a developer machine performing. As soon yeah. as they are writing it, that it performs well. How would you implement this? So, like I said, we have um, a, a few options. You know, some static analysis tools or linting tools um, allow you to, well, we'll run alongside your coding environment, your coding IDE, right? Um, to, to give you information as you go. And again, I don't want to brandish the artificial intelligence thing too much because I have my reservations. But mm -hmm. we must admit that it's going to be transformative. It's already very transformative. Anybody who's tried uh, Copilot, you know, GitHub Copilot or any other tool that looks like it, um, it's extremely, extremely efficient. Uh, it's, it's able to give you code. It's able to explain the code. Um, and if you, is in, if you use it the right way, it's also able to give you alternatives with performance improvements depending on the scale you want it to go, right? So if you have, if you want to have a, absolute readability, it's going to give you a piece of code. And if you want it to go through the very min, you know, minute details of the small improvements you could make, you can strong arm it in giving you other pieces of advice. So um, to answer your question, to keep it short and sweet, um, it needs to run on the developer uh, laptop, right? This is this is something that um, I wanted to, I, and I asked a little bit on purpose because I know some IDEs and SDKs uh, where if you are diligent with your unit testing and you write the right scripts and your unit tests have some performance metrics timers and things that the developers can 
uh, check. And this is aligned a little bit with um, TDD or PDD, as I like to call it. Um, while they are writing the code, these unit tests are being executed automatically by the platform. And, and as you say, it's not a release, it's not a check-in, it's not has not left the developer's machine. And they know that the performance sucks or if they are doing something wrong or something like that before they even uh, submit the code uh, for, for a PR or just check it in. It's, they already know. And you guarantee that's the very first um, gateway, the, the, a very good shift left that you are bringing up so that, yeah, even just hitting compile, they know how slow it is or how, how interesting. And this is some sort of um, easing it, the, the transition, making it as transparent and as easy, kind of like baby steps for uh, adopting this. And, and I'm guessing as well, right, this, all this philosophy should be baby stepped, right? What, what, what is your perspective there? Well, of course, um, a baby doesn't learn to walk uh, the first time they try to. And Wait, you didn't? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> and my daughter certainly didn't too. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you have to go through um, various um, phases to see the interest in that, right? And mm -hmm. if you join a company that tells you what I've been told, right? You're not going to do test yourself and we want you to transform the way the company works when it comes to performance. You will not have results if you're trying to shove load testing down everybody's throats. It's mm -hmm. not going to work. So you need to think, okay, I'm a company within the company. I need to find my product market fit, right? I need to find how I must work to address my customers. So yeah, these customers are in-house, yeah. But part of the, of the baby steps um, process is I need to find enthusiasts. I need to find early adopters because these people are going to be my sponsors. They're going to become my beta testers la later on. And I mm -hmm. will need to test uh, um, new, new features, new new systems with a small population before I impact maybe the 10,000 people who rely on the systems I provide, right? And you don't want to, to break everything for 10,000 people because you're going to have a very difficult discussion. Um, so yeah, think about sponsors, beta testers, and can deal with the skeptics, you know, the laggards later on. These are the people that are going to cost you a lot of energy a lot of time, a lot of financial resources to bring on, right? I think that that strategy, like um, having early adopters, uh, implementers, or even like hey, uh, and and you say like um, that the people that are excited about this thing and will be like your champions. I think that as long as you have at the very least a pilot team that shows how amazing is it going to be. Then you can run around and have that like as, hey, look what we did here, there and there, and this team. And and even your haters, to call it in a way, will say like, huh, I think they are having a good time with that thing. Why, why, why should I keep fighting against it or pushing back? Uh, and, and as long as I think uh, mixed with these baby steps and performance culture, um, uh, that, that, they can embrace all these changes. And as long as you see someone, your neighbor having something cool, even as you hated it and at the beginning, oh, those damn Teslas are gonna, oh, huh, everyone is getting a Tesla. Should I also, hmm. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's about the Tesla, but sometimes, you know, for some people it's about the title. So mm -hmm. um, some people are very invested in staying, uh, in, in having this promotion for staff engineer for example, you know, um, because I want to be transversal. I want to have a high impact on the organization. I want to be called to become a principal engineer in my organization. So I want to be a high level individual contributor and seeing these people getting promoted because they do performance related stuff is going to bring you on board because in the end, you don't want to, um, to be too late, right? You don't want to fall behind. 
So I think it's always a matter of incentivizing people to come on the train. And you mm. only have to resort to, um, I, I call it process violence, right? Forcing people to do stuff because otherwise they will not be able to push code, for example. Like saying, you don't have any performance tests, so you're not able to merge your code um, on, on the main branch. That's something that some people would do from the get-go. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you, don't, you don't punish people, you incentivize them. And if some people have a proven rec record of not coming on board with enough, enough um, incentives, then you, you get to the stick. Right? No, but it's, it's at the very end. And it's something that um, I, I think I'm following up with my uh, Texa, te Tesla analogy. Yeah, eventually, well, we are going to remove gas stations. Mm. So it's up to you if you want to keep like you can uh, refine your own gasoline and try to do it yourself. But in the end, eventually, uh, the bar is going to be like, yeah, it's not efficient and it's not easy to you. Yeah. But I didn't use the Tesla analogy just by accident. Teslas are not cheap most mm. of the time, even if you have government incentives, blah, blah, blah. And these incentives, these budgets got to come from above. How, how do you deal with like, because generally I'm, a, I'm a just a developer in my basement creating code. I'm not deciding this. How, how, how do you go around that in the culture? Yeah, you don't do cultural shift without having very strong and very high sponsors. It just has to be this way. Mm -hmm. You need to have, so maybe that's the sea level at the company you, you work for. Uh, maybe you just need a bunch of directors on board to, to make that change because the division you work in is uh, has uh, um, a high enough level of autonomy to do that kind of changes. But still, you need very high level sponsors. And that means mm -hmm. that these people need to understand that business velocity really comes down to speed times quality. And if they don't believe that quality will make them faster, you will not succeed. That's a change that is going to be to be wasteful, right? That's a process that going to that is going to be a problem. Um, so you need to have top management on board. And when I say top management, I, I, I don't mean people who say during meetings, yeah, quality is important. And when, hmm. the, and when the, the meeting is over, we just go back to things the way, to, to, to the way things were, right? You need to, to have a company that shows systematic willingness to empower quality. And that means promoting people that do quality related things. Because of that, the organization needs to not promote people who do not do quality related things. And also, I think that uh, the culture needs to be very accountability pay based. So this is one of the principles of DevOps, right? You build it, you run it. So if you're a developer and you produce a defect, a big defect that is going to bring down production, who's going to be awoken at night to, to fix this? Is it going to be not necessarily you, but is it going to be one of your coworkers, one of the developers, or is this going to be the ops team? Right? Definitely, it's not going to be the CFO who will approve the budget for this type of uh, culture changes. But, and 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 this is a, a last uh, and kind of interesting question from what you're mentioning, because yeah, it could be like the product owner, it could be. Uh, um, mid-level leadership who say like, yeah, this is very important that we start a pass to developers, that we start to adopt these new practices. But if whoever approves the moolah, the, the coins to flow around, how, how would you work around that? Because I know that's a challenge. You need not having approval at the very top level. Yeah, I mean, how, how would you get that approval, even if... Um, because this is, uh, as you were saying, organizations that don't have this culture, mm, maybe pass, right? Okay, so I need to, to give a bit of context here. Um, in the organization, I was um, asked to, 
to have that kind of impact, right? The org- so it's a, it was an organization that first said, like, we need this. Let's oh, bring yeah. someone that, um, what's, what's the name? Uh, advocates for this and starts spreading the word, the gospel. and Yeah. In fact, I was part of a, of a tribe that was called Developer Experience. So the whole thing was to give tool support and everything, like I said before. Um, and the very top level was convinced we need we needed to do that. That was the right choice, right? But because of the the, the speed at which uh, my colleagues were recruited, it was just not possible to have um, a, a homogenous culture when it comes to quality. It's just if you bring hordes and hordes of new developers, right? And these people have to first thing in the morning not learn the business not learn the the software but recruit other people in the end you're going to have competing cultures so i'm not really answering your question but you know kind of you're kind of because because you need to have everyone on board yeah the organization at the higher tiers already was convinced that this was a need and in my experience each c-level people are not willing to listen and are going to give you a hard time to even consider that quality is important. My, my Until personal they belief, have been beaten. My personal belief is that the, the, the company is not worth your time. It's mm-hmm. going, you, don't have, you don't need to convince people that good choices are good, right? You need to Ooh. articulate them properly, right? But if your CEO is a laggard, Right. If there, if these people are skeptics, it's just, it's just too hard, because in mm-hmm. the end, that's their company. What what you're saying? Because you you're just you right now are to, you're you're talking directly to hey performance engineers are hearing listening to this episode. Uh, if your company doesn't have this attitude, well, eh, what are you doing there, kind of? But at the same time, you're saying, hey, C-level person that hopefully is listening to this episode, if you are not paying attention to this, you will lose employees, you will lose, you will have the effect, you will have performance problems. We could do a whole episode just mentioning what could happen, Mr. C or Miss uh, C-level person, if you don't pay attention to this. Oh, damn. Right? Yeah, and I think that one of the most impactful arguments these days is not anymore the the argument about response time that allegedly impacts the the percentage of your um, customers that are going to go through paying for the, the your car, sales right? or your plan. Yeah, mm-hmm. so of course this is true. That part is true, but some people don't see it in numbers, so they don't really believe it. But if you talk to your CFO and say by doing performance testing, I'm going, we are able to reduce the amount of infrastructure we have to pay for. They're there going there to are some it. arguments that you can do. It's, well, it's a double-edged sword because you can use those elements like, hey, we can optimize your cloud performance, which is a big topic lately. But in the old days, it was like an insurance. And C-level people were like, we have never had a performance incident. Why we are paying to these little people who are charging this much? Uh, maybe that's why you haven't had an incident. <laughs> it's, it's this type of things that until um, they are not burned, they don't see that they should be adopting these new practices, mm. enabling developers and making these transitions, these baby steps, bringing people like you to help the organization to see and appreciate what is the advantage what are the steps, what they should do. And looking at the time and to do a little bit of a ramp down uh, for this episode, uh, would you mind sharing some closing thoughts, some last words that you would like, like, hey, people listening at Perfites, uh, if you're a C-level, do this. If you are a performer, do this. Or if you're a developer, what would you like to give us closing thoughts? Okay, so C-level, like I said, um, performance can save you money um, when it comes to the amount of business you're not. No, no, going no, to... no, no, no. You said can. No, no. Will. 
save you money. We, sorry, yeah, we'll save you. <laughs> we'll save you money. You're a better advocate than I am. Um, yeah, so performance will save you money if you if you do things right. If you bring the if you bring the right people on board, and um, this is going to be either more business or either um, less expenses. And these days, the expense reduction uh, argument tends to to be very impactful with these people, you know. Um, so that's the that's one. To aspiring or even uh, seasoned performance engineers or performance testing engineers, I say, please brush up your um, your soft skills because mm. you're in an inherently adversarial relationship with developers, right? We all have this weird relationship with the work we produce. When someone tells us what, what you've produced is not good, we all hear you are not good. So mm -hmm. you have to be very mindful with how you say things and how you act. So you need to be supportive. And one of the, if I could give a little tip, is that always give credit to people, always. Say, this person did this and that, and I was just here to, you know, to, to do the glue work because this level of humbleness will pay dividends with the teams, with the leaders, because don't, don't be fooled. These people can see a team player and can see someone who's just batting for their own business. So that's, that's the second one. You know, be mindful of your soft skills, work with the developers. And my position about this is you are here to support them. Right, because they mm -hmm. are producing the the software, right? And you can do the best possible tests, but if there's not any feature in the product, you will not sell anything, and everybody's going to lose their jobs. So developers are absolutely, absolutely essential. And some companies don't have performance testers, but they still do amazing, amazing stuff. Uh, they're, 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 those are the ones where there are SDATs maybe or not specifically, but they have like all, all I, I don't like the, the this term of full stack testers or engineer, blah, blah, blah. But there are people in their uh, organizations that, yeah, this you, you, you have a bunch of people that know A, B, C, and D, and they are not, they, not only T-shaped, they are E-shaped or W or all the shapes uh, in one. That's that's an important one, but still, I wouldn't go around without a performance uh, engineer. I like to call it uh, at the very least a performer supreme that goes around like sharing the gospel of performance with the organization, and not only the gospel, the know-how. Uh, mm. Again, not giving them the fish, but teaching them how to. I'm going to biblical here, but um, exactly. I, I I take from that that you can be. Um, a supporter, a teacher, uh, someone that goes around spreading the gospel, right? Um, that's something I aspire to do. <laughs> I don't know if that's something I'm going to be at some point, uh, but I think it all um, it's all about the efforts, right? So I try to coach the people around me as much as I can. Um, I try to help the, the rising engineers, the, the young ones, that, uh, that are getting in the business today and give them pointers. Um, but, you know, as, as a closing statement, um, if he listens to this, I'm going to be very happy, but the best manager I ever had was one with zero ego, zero. He was just there for the team. He didn't care um, who made a mistake or not. He just gave you credit. He left you all the space you needed to grow. And that was just it, you know. He... I, I, I totally agree. I think the best managers are the ones that, like, they are not the character. They are just pushing the play around them and making sure that everything keeps flowing and that we get an awesome environment, team, solution, everything. They are just like another cog there trying to have everything. Yeah. Uh, very well said, very good recommendations. I I hope that everyone that is listening will get 
so many insights and the gears running are up or if they are managers, if they are performance engineers, if they are developers, I would be super happy to uh, find out that developers are uh, watching and listening to the show. And Matt, I want to thank you very, very much for bringing this uh, knowledge, these recommendations, your experience. And to close up, uh, I would like to know um, what's next for you and um, where people could find you or get in touch or reach out to get more of your knowledge or, well, you're a freelancer, so uh, get some of your services or uh, evangelists. <laughs> sure. So I'm around mostly on uh, LinkedIn, you know. Um, I don't do content creation because I'm a bit too lazy to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I rely on uh, everybody else's efforts like yours. Um, so yeah, mostly LinkedIn. Uh, I guess you will be able to find my uh, actual complete name uh, in the description. Um, so We're my gonna name share Mathieu... links and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my name is Mathieu Leroux Huet. Um, and uh, yeah, that's about it. You know, I'm all about trying to share the love these days, uh, trying to coach and, uh, and finding new interesting uh, projects I can do for clients. Um, so reach out. If you have questions, feel free to do so, to, to, to send them to LinkedIn. And I don't bite. I usually accept everybody. <laughs> so just go ahead. Awesome. There you have it. So if you want to get so get in touch, get some of this knowledge, the experience, or what would you do with these developers, C-level people, or in this situation, or even ask for some of the professional service uh, from Matt, um, get in touch. We're going to put all the links or the contacts uh, in the details of this video or this podcast. And uh, don't waste any time. Get in touch with Matt. Matt, I want to thank you so much for coming and sharing uh, all your experiences, all your knowledge. It has been a pleasure. Thank you, Leandro. It was a great pleasure also. Thank you. Thank you very much. And well, everyone, this was the episode for today. Stay tuned because we're going to be bringing more stuff, more knowledge, more people. We're going to have Hendrik back in future episodes. And well, I hope that you enjoyed, that you learned a lot, and that you take a lot of advantage of having an awesome performer like Matt here with us. And with that, um, Pervites out. And thank you very much. Take care, everyone. Have a great day. Cheers, Adios, everybody. Matt. Bye-bye. <laughs>